I'm Abel Sate, I work for a union. Uh, my background is I'm an electrician by trade, uh, six years in university uh, in the United States. Um, I worked a variety of different jobs, both in mechanical, construction, oil companies, big oil as peers called it, uh, metal manufacturing, now for a union. And throughout last 15 years, uh, involved with you know, client debate, climate uh, policies, uh, the politics of it, uh, also the science of it. And uh, I'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Let's see, let's get the big guy going here. We have around 60,000 members, 20,000 elected union reps. We're the fourth largest union inside ELO. We are the most powerful union among uh, the energy workers. Um, that is a history that goes back to the unionization of the oil workers. And big oil and oil workers have always had a big influence on society. Um, we work extremely hard for a safe work environment. That's primordial um, uh, effort for us. Um, most of our workers are shift workers, meaning they rotate throughout the week, the year, uh, which is a tough uh, condition or tough working conditions. We want to secure fair compensation for our workers and we work extensively on industrial growth with fewer emissions. Uh, we do anything in the oil and gas, petrochemical, power intensive industries, aluminum, nickel, ferrous, silicon, uh, cement, recycling, bioenergy, processing industries. Uh, we even have some uh, furniture, um, isolators for power poles and so on. So it's a mixture of old unions. So to theory, um, Industry Energy is not a science union. We have no scientists. We work with our external environment. Uh, we firmly believe in the precautionary principle. It rules in industry, it rules in science, and for the environment, for everything we do. Is that we will take a decision based on something we believe to be of significant risk to us. The climate debate, uh, personally back in 2005, there was a huge uh, global uh, debate around whether it was a, a man-made contribution was significant enough to cause climate change. Um, there was massive spending on scientists on both sides uh, to propagate one theory or the other theory that would refute the other one. It turned into a battle. Um, but I'm very confident to say that uh, a lot of scientists that I know that have contributed towards um, a variety of uh, work, both for UNFCC, but for other specific work like um, consequences of acidification of the ocean, um, are wholly uh, goodwill people. They are not uh, out to get anyone. A lot of them are working without corporate finance. Um, I don't believe that uh, the work that's been going on is a giant conspiracy. Now, there are a lot of stuff around climate, which um, is big business. But that, that does not mean that climate is a um, big conspiracy. For us, whether it's 90% of global scientists believe that climate change is real and we need to do something, or it's 50%, as long as there is sufficient reason to act, and the governments that we work with deem it something we need to do something about, we will take their word for it. 
In 2005, um, a lot of people believed that climate was real, uh, that the emissions were made from carbon, from carbon was a significant threat. Uh, I was in Copenhagen, uh, that didn't amount to much, but I've traveled around uh, in Europe, in the US, after Paris, and uh, virtually there's no debate anymore. Now, for the scientists that work on this, it's a continual optimization, and you will find discrepancies over time for any model that's produced, uh, any prediction will change over time because you adjust the models you work with. So whether it's uh, uh, 1.5 or 51 degrees, 1.5 degrees, uh, it's not something that we will have an opinion about, that's something we hear. So when Paris says two degrees, possibly one and a half degrees, is the target we need to go for? Well, we operate along the lines of securing what, uh, our interests in the framework of either two degrees or one and a half degrees. We believe that if there's going to be a concerted effort, be it for renewables, for carbon capture storage, or anything related to climate, to climate finance, uh, you have to have people in mind. If the people are not secured in terms of employment, food security or similar, they couldn't care less. Their immediate need is going to be food or employment. Even though they may be concerned about climate, that's going to be their immediate need. So we argue that Climate solutions or climate regimes has to focus on labor. That is important. We believe technology is the answer and that that's going to be a continual evolution of what we do today. We don't believe there's going to be a paradigm shift. Uh, five years from now, somebody's going to come up with something that will totally change the whole uh, game. Um, but I will say, though, that the changes in the markets and the technology field that I've experienced over the last 10 years is mind-boggling. Um, it's hard to uh, keep track of the technology that's being developed and how it's going to impact our lives. And that causes a lot of uncertainty. Um, I know that uh, uh, some are thinking that, you know, 20 years from now, what are we going to work? What are we going to do? Uh, is my job going to be automated away? Or is some technology going to do everything that we do now? The other main paradigm is that capital will always be constrained, meaning that there is will never be sufficient capital in people's mind or in companies to undertake uh, what's needed. We know there's enough capital globally to recycle into tackling this issue, but um, how governments prioritize, how companies prioritize, means that capital will always be in short supply. That's why we argue that if you spend the climate dollar or a euro, or a pound, or a Norwegian kroner, that kroner needs to be spent efficiently. And it has to be qualified with a global reduction as far as CO2 is concerned. If it's particle emissions, that's something we are concerned about in cities. If it's uh, NOx or uh, nanomaterials, that's something that impacts us directly. And so, uh, uh, back to what Pierce said about diesel, and it's true that um, a lot of climate uh, environmentalists argued, well, 30 to 40 percent, uh, in best cases, higher efficiency from diesel engines than conventional gas engines, we should go for diesel. And this happened in Norway. The taxes on diesel went down, and three out of four cars sold, I think, were diesels. 
Net result is that the particle emissions and NOx emissions went up in the cities and smog increased. Four years, five years went by and the authorities realized that the indirect negative impacts were sufficient enough to where they had to reverse. And needless to say, people get frustrated because so many people bought diesel cars and now they're not popular anymore. Uh, there are two things that are important for us. Uh, it's hydrocarbons and hydropower. That organizes or provides work for the majority of all the people that we organize. We are in the very fortunate situation that hydropower has virtually no CO2 emissions and that the Norwegian continental shelf has comparably very low CO2 emissions per megajoule produced from the ground delivered to a refinery or a petrochemical plant. So when we assume that we are, reg we are regulated on CO2, be it a CO2 standard or a uh, uh, European emission trading system, we want to make sure that our factual emissions are accounted for, what, really what they are, on site or in the product, and that when we compare that product to somebody else's product, that we get the benefit for it. When we compete with China, we know that the uh, majority of the power supply that goes into the aluminum, ferrosilicon, magnesium, which I'll touch upon, is coal power. It's largely at cost, meaning if, um, a cent, half a cent per kilow kilowatt hour provided. Um, other type of emissions are also far higher and in a global market for a product, if our product gets displaced by a, a ton of steel or a ton of aluminum produced on inefficient coal, global climate does not benefit, global environment does not benefit if that is uh, a ton of steel that's displacing our ton of steel or our ton of aluminum. That's why big oil, big aluminum, Big Nickel wants a global regime. It is not because they want to uh, cream the market. It's because they want equal and fair competitive global markets. A uh, little story. Uh, in the US, uh, in the 2000s, uh, oil companies and all other industries, including the unions, fought climate regulations hard. Uh, I ended up in the U.S. in 2007 and I spoke to the utilities. Uh, they had mixed bags, some coal, some nuke, some gas, some renewables. Um, they fought cap and trade and I couldn't understand it. If you're a power utility in a cap and trade market, it's a no-brainer for revenue to have that regime because you will profit tremendously on it. The biggest gainers from cap and trade are the utilities. They estimate that between 2005 and 2012 in Europe, the utilities, Kraftsatskapene, in Europe gained somewhere around 70 billion euros in extra profits. And I don't know if a billion or 10 billion or anything was recycled into new renewables or reduced emissions. There's no requirement to recycle your profits from that market into actual investments. Uh, in Norway, because climate in Norway is basically a national thing, it's a small basket where Norway thinks it can largely solve the climate problem by what we do here. So, some people say if we shut down the Norwegian continental shelf that that would set a good example for the rest of the world so they would do the same. We don't think that's true. We think that would increase global emissions. As long as Norway has low CO2 emissions for gas and oil, in a climate constrained world, let the last barrel come from Norway. 
If Norway had high emissions from our oil and gas, my prediction would be we would be phased out earlier than some other nation that could provide oil and gas with lower carbon emissions. We are strong believers in converting power to usable goods, be it aluminum or any other product, because we know that provides more jobs. We know that if a ton of aluminum, a ton of nickel, ferrous silicon, silicium, uh, is sold in a market, uh, that will compete and hopefully prof profitably with more CO2 intensive products. Um, we have fought uh, extensively electrification of the oil industry because it reduces employment. We believe it increases global emissions of CO2 and NOx. We do know that it reduces the noise on the platforms, which is good for the working environment on the platforms. But it's um, a bad climate policy to spend billions on converting hydropower to natural gas. We like to tell everybody that Norway's industries are a solution for a better climate globally and for reduced emissions, and that's technology related. The better technology you can utilize to produce a good we need, the fewer emissions you'll have. When Norway develops technologies, the companies that operate here, they will take that technology and bring it to China. They'll bring it somewhere else. If we can be best in class on efficiency, efficient operations, and low emissions, that's technology we can sell and earn money from. We also know that uh, the renewable growth is going to continue. Um, it's a fact that solar, in many cases now, even with a storage package, outcompete coal. And in many places also outcompete gas. Now, have they included all costs? Uh, rarely. But when you see the demand, the exponential growth in that sector and the rapid decline of cost for solar PV and also wind, uh, if you ask any uh, banker or company out there that operates in that market, they are spending billions investing in those markets much, much less so in gas and coal. In the United States, m more billions of dollars were spent on renewables than on coal and gas. Because it's business. And the United States don't have a CO2 cap. They have no cap and trade. It's business. Uh, about the money, uh, 70 billion in potential windfall for utilities. Uh, we deal with domestic politics um, daily. Uh, domestic politics impacts our union, it impacts the industry. Uh, Norway's decided to build two more power export cables. Uh, Total package around 5 billion euro. Well, maybe I've got an exchange rate a little off, but an additional 1 to 3 billion euros will be spent um, to upgrade the grid onshore. Uh, total investments uh, in Norway is around 70 billion kroners or uh, slightly s less than 10 billion euro to export power, electrify the oil industry, and provide some grid for the 12 billion euros they can spend on uh, new wind and some hydropower, small hydro. In the last five years, uh, total bill, um, 20, 25 billion euros uh, have been voted on in parliament and put into motion, meaning stop net, the power companies, and so on. Uh, without assessing direct and indirect impact for climate, for jobs, and so on. 
We received a report from the IA uh, in April, May, which said if Norway build more power export cables, power prices in Norway will double. It was in the news. Um, I read the report. It assumes more cables. It also assumes higher emission prices on allowances. We know for a fact that if you double the power price to 50 euro per kilowatt hour or 8 euro cents per kilowatt hour, 80 for a megawatt hour, that that's a power price that none of our power industries can afford to pay. They will shut down. On Monday, the magnesium factory at Harøya, not too far from here, shut down. There was 120 jobs. Um, I'm going to show a slide which tells you some of the reasons why they closed down. Um, that's a sad loss for Harøya. It's not good for the world. Um, it's not good for Norway's export income. I think I have two complex slides, this one isn't. Those lines there are the power prices for long-term contracts to industry in Norway. Uh, they are real prices for what industry had to negotiate with. Uh, due to a lot of insecurities in the market, uh, in decisions about CO2 compensation, um, the cap and trade regime, whether we're going to build two or four or six new export cables, the power prices went up in Norway. Most of the industry in Norway had power contracts, long power contracts that expired in 2012. They all had to renegotiate their power contracts by the end of 2011. And I know for a fact that Harjo uh, Magnesium Factory got their contract in November 2011, right at the peak, when the power prices were the highest. They have to compete with the Chinese with low power prices. And even though we're more efficient, you can't compete when the power cost equates to 20%, 30%, 40% of your total cost to produce a good. Difficult. When it comes to Norway exporting power, it said that while well, that's going to save emissions abroad, that may be, but we know that when you export Norwegian hydropower that you're likely to displace gas power, particularly in the UK. A lot of that gas is Norwegian gas. We asked the authorities, how many cubic meters of Norwegian gas is Norwegian power exports going to displace or take away? We did not get an answer, so we hired somebody to do the job. And the indicative number is around about 2 billion cubic meters of Norwegian gas is likely to get displaced when Norway builds its one interconnector to the UK. 2 billion cubic meters. So they're a kroner and 50 euro each. Do you have anything on your mind? Okay. Uh, so potential loss could be three billion. Uh, in addition, if you increase supply of power in the market, you're going to drive prices down. When you make more available gas in the market, gas prices go down. We asked, what are the net impacts of releasing more gas into the market on Norway's income? We export 28 billion cubic meters of gas to the UK yearly. If the power price or the gas price goes down by 5 euro, take 28 billion times 5 euro, what's the impact? That's revenue that we get from the oil and gas sector. And we ask that when you take decisions that is regarding industry, power, or climate, that you look upon indirect impacts. This is uh, somewhat of a um, what-if slide. Uh, the estimate is that these export cables will uh, export 10 to 12, possibly 13 terawatt hours per year 
largely to the UK. 13, 12 terawatts is enough to produce 1 million tons of aluminum. 5 billion investment could produce 1.4 million tons of aluminum. 1 million tons of aluminum gives about 3,000 direct jobs and 2 to 3 times more indirect jobs. Um, 1 million tons with the current aluminum prices is about 2 billion euros a year in revenues. 50% of that comes to taxes and to state and government and income taxes from the people working at the factory. Um, while industry has been received much more positive in Norway in the last five years, uh, we see a largely a prioritization of exporting power and gas um, on, uh, well, not converted to anything else but uh, the raw material that it is. Um, our industrial policy when it comes to uh, Europe, we realize we're in a global market that Norway has to be competitive when it produces aluminum. We don't want to throw money after projects that don't run, that are not profitable. But when the government make decisions, when Tord Lien says, Jeg lurer ble i lave kraftpriser. He is sick and tired of low power prices, our Minister of Energy. Uh, then he uh, produces a government white paper that seeks to fulfill that goal to increase power prices. Then they make a priority that higher power prices are more important than converting power. That's a choice you make. I don't know, this may be a little, I don't know how interesting this is, but uh, that's the world as it was. Norway had 6,000 megawatts of, no, 5,400 megawatts of export, which was more than sufficient for all our needs for security of supply. Uh, if the oil plants goes through now, uh, that includes a second cable to UK, we'll have north of 10,000 megawatts of export. Uh, we asked the government, how many hours per year is 6,000 megawatts insufficient? We didn't get a response. 10,000 megawatts at 8,670 hours a year is 80 terawatt hours per year or more. Norway produces 134. We now will have the capacity to export two-thirds of all the power we produce. That's never going to happen, but the utilities now have the opportunity to price optimize every hour of the year to obtain the highest price in the market. This is my busiest slide, and what it does, it shows that in Scotland, in Peterhead, is a 1150 megawatt power gas station which receives gas from Norway and also the UK sector via Brent, Stoutfjord. The cable that's uh, proposed now, a private one, is going to landfall in the same area. And this slide is to exemplify will Norwegian power export displace the Peterhead power station? We asked the question. What are the impacts? In the uh, government white paper, uh, it says that power conversion in Norway employs 40,000 people. If you say there's an additional 40,000 people that supply that industry, that lives off of that industry, somewhere around 80,000 people depend upon converting power and energy to a product. I feel fairly certain that if we reach six to seven euro cents per kilowatt hour, that the next time industries go to negotiate a contract, that the national owners, Chinese Blue Star and the others, will think twice about getting a new one or reinvesting. That's a bad concern and I know that industry in Norway is deeply concerned about it. 
Then, as far as a paradox, second busy slide. Um, electrification of the oil sector. A tremendous political debate in Norway. Uh, simply, what you do is an oil platform today will most likely have a gas turbine on it that produces the heat and power you need. That creates emissions offshore. The idea here is to reduce domestic emissions. So we'll shut down the gas turbine and we'll take hydropower from the grid. When you do that, you free up the gas you otherwise would use on that platform and you export it to Europe. A little technical here, but 50% of that gas will get burnt outside the emission trading system. 100% of the allowances will be sold to the European emission trading system. You move 100% of the emissions, but you shift 50% of the gas outside the emission allowance system. Net result, worst case, is a 50% increase inside Europe as a function of a domestic climate action policy. Our claim is that life cycle analysis cross-border must be undertaken for all climate activities. And that includes climate science. It includes climate politics. Uh, that way we can ensure that decisions we make, we can um, become aware of the indirect impacts, we can mitigate them, we can do something about them. We could still do this project, but let's say if you decided that, well, we're going to retire all the allowances. We're not going to sell the allowances for profit. We're going to retire them, bury them. That's one thing. We're going to ensure that all the gas gets burnt inside the emission trading system so that there's no leakage outside. And we're going to mitigate the 250 tons of NOx emissions that you move from the platform to densely populated areas in Europe. When you emit NOx in the ocean, offshore, very few people will have respiratory impacts from that. When you burn the same cubic meter in the city or on your stove, the emissions will have a direct impact. There's ways to deal with this, but very few, the, the, the options to mitigate the negative impacts were not undertaken. So we took it upon ourselves, even though it's required by regulation that there is ISO standards for life cycle analysis, nobody would undertake one. So we put CICERO of the University of Oslo to uh, assess what the indirect impacts are from electrification. Poirier Consultancy assisted. And it says that net result is that all other options than electrification from the grid will provide a larger CO2 emission cuts inside Europe. Um, if you then uh, look at uh, employment impacts, you will find that most of the other options will provide higher employment and lower emissions. If you spend $2 billion on electrifying a platform, that increases emissions or spend $2 billion on the project that reduces emissions 20%, it's a more rational project to spend $2 billion on 20% reduction than $2 billion on a project that increases emissions. The other issue that we have is that most of the costs that are associated with these cables, electrification, get shifted to society and other industries. And we deem that grossly unfair that businesses with limited ability to pay is cross-subsidizing a very rich industry. Granted, you know, oil price just burst through $50. Um, it's been hard times in the oil industry. Uh, 60,000 jobs have been lost. And we should remember that one out of five kroners spent on our budgets 
come from the oil industry. So 20%. It does matter what happens. And for the first time, this government withdrew. Uh, we ran a deficit and we have withdrawn more than we have put in. I hope it's the first time that happens, that we don't see that happen again. Long time ago, Gro Harlem Brundtland was in the UN. The Rio Agreement. She said something about internalizing environmental costs. She said something about environmental impact assessments. That's a gift because emissions that uh, uh, traverses borders had to be taken into account here. Um, the long-term impact of what happened in the 80s uh, is a long string of regulations that are improving people's lives in cities uh, and elsewhere every day. But there has been very limited um, application of cross-border assessments when it comes to climate politics. And that's concerning because carbon leakage serves no one and oftentimes um, has dire impacts for people's welfare. Thank you.